Hey, hey, so welcome back to Paleo. Today is Biospatigraphy Day. So we're cruising on through chapters 8 through 12, and, or 8 through 10, sorry, in the textbook. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first, some announcements. If you have any questions with that, uh, please reach out to me or your preferably your advisor. Um, so let's review what we talked about last time. So in gas exchange processes, like say evaporation, and biologic processes like photosynthesis, heavier isotopes tend to be what? So the heavier carbon-13 versus carbon-12, and the heavier O18 versus O16. So are they used at a same rate, a higher rate, a lower rate, or are they just not used at all in these processes? So what do you think? Think back to last time. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, they are used at a lower rate. So for example, in evaporation, the lighter, the, ox the water is containing the lighter oxygen molecules, are preferentially evaporated and it leaves the heavier oxygen mo molecules behind. So in warmer temperatures, when there's more evaporation, uh, that heavy oxygen becomes concentrated in the seas and uh, carbon is, is concentrated in vegetation, the lighter carbon. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, so terrestrial animals, being rafted to a different, to a distant island is an example of what kind of dispersal? So we talked about a bunch of different dispersal mechanisms last time. Uh, so these terrestrial animals get adrift on a raft and they happen to make it to a distant island. That's an example of three, two, one. That's an example of sweepstakes dispersal. So it's an incredibly unlikely event. It's uh, very fortuitous circumstances for them to actually make it there and establish a new population. Uh, but given all of geologic time, unlikely things happen. And so, yeah, that's an example of sweepstakes. Uh, filter bridge was the example where uh, there's like a connection between two habitats, uh, but only certain animals are using it or it's one directional. Uh, Noah's Ark was the animals kind of riding on the continent. So the Indian fauna go along for the ride with the Indian subcontinent. And then when it docks with Asia, they kind of got off and migrated away. And then the Viking funeral ship was, say, all the ancient fossils on India. They went along for the ride. The difference between that and Noah's Ark is they can't get off. They're dead. They're in the rocks. Um, so that was some of the dispersal mechanisms we talked about last time. So let's go ahead and get into biostratigraphy. So one of the key things that makes biostratigraphy work is that there's this faunal succession. So there is a pattern, a predictable pattern, a order, a succession of different fauna through geologic time. And this was recognized pretty early on. Uh, most notably, William Smith used fossils and mapped the rocks around England, and uh, he would use them to connect up one place to another. So uh, a lot of the rocks look very similar. So the fossil content turned out to work for him. And they, he noticed, and others had noticed before, uh, that there's an order to this appearance and disappearance of certain organisms. And uh, this is a figure from a book. Uh, this is from 1888. So all the way back 1888, this idea that these organisms change through time in systematic ways and that they are lumped into these different like units was already kind of recognized. Uh, what's very interesting about this is you'll notice like looking at the systems here, uh, Laurentian that eventually became what we know as the Precambrian, uh, but Cambrian's here, Silurian's here. Oh, Ordovician's missing. We'll talk about that in a second. All the rest of the big players are here. 
uh, we're missing Paleocene, we're missing Oligocene, but all the big players are here. The geologic time scale is already relatively set here. Uh, there's still kind of this old nomenclature of primary, secondary, and tertiary, uh, a little bit different fauna being assigned to it, but again, that kind of recognizes like the, the Paleozoic fauna, the Mesozoic fauna, and like the modern fauna kind of split into those. And remember those names still kind of stick with us today in the form of the tertiary and the quaternary. Uh, so pretty interesting. This, this idea was relatively early recognized in the history of geology. And one of the main results of this was the, the map that changed the world. So William, his nickname was William Strata Smith. So that's a pretty cool nickname, of course, cartographer anyways. Uh, so William Strata Smith was a surveyor on a canal project that was, they were building a canal across England uh, to transport coal. And they were digging through and excavating rocks that people hadn't seen before. They were making fresh outcrop. So he had this very unique opportunity to see rocks that no one else had before. And obviously, as he was traversing the countryside through this cartography, he started seeing these repeating patterns of rock units. And he probably had a little bit of trouble telling them apart. Uh, as we know from some of the field trips, sometimes a sandstone looks like a sandstone looks like a sandstone, and a shale looks like a shale looks like a shale. How do you tell them apart? So he started actually using not just the rock type, but the fossil content as well. And so this was kind of like the early, uh, very early work on biostratigraphy. He was using fossils and the stories go that he was like wowed to people at the time by like how he could pinpoint what order a rock fell in the sequence just by looking at fossils. And he could tell you by looking at a fossil probably where it came from. So he probably won quite a few beers at the local pub with his skills. Um, and he earned that cool nickname and eventually became recognized as the, the father of English geology. And uh, there's a very good book about it by Simon Winchester, uh, pretty much a must read for any geologist. And it actually comes with a nice cool fold out version of the map, it's really neat. Uh, when I was in grad school, the map was actually kind of on traveling around and it was very neat to be able to see it in person. It's much larger than you would think. Um, so, but yeah, this was like the first like real scale geologic map and it's so good that it's still pretty accurate. Uh, it's still useful today. Um, so uh, some of the early people that started using this work though, ran into a little bit of trouble. Uh, so one of the greatest geological controversies of all time, uh, one of the biggest feuds, kind of like the Hatfields versus McCoys of geology, was this feud of Sedgwick versus Murchison. So Adam Sedgwick was a professor at Cambridge. He was the first ever geology professor. So uh, I follow in his footsteps <laughs> much, much later though. Um, and Roderick Murchison uh, was working as well. And together they set out to categorize the rocks between what they referred to as the old red sandstone, a widely recognized unit in England, and the primary, the, the, the crystalline basement rocks. Uh, so they called this the transitional zone, the, the, the gap in between the basement and the old red sandstone, all the rocks in between. So they kind of divvied it up and Sedgwick started working from the bottom up. So Sedgwick started working from the crystalline basement on up and Murchison started working from the old red sandstone down. And so Sedgwick called his stuff that he was working on the Cambrian. And as we know from uh, earlier lessons, early Cambrian strata is sparsely fossiliferous. Um, there's less diversity around, uh, not none. So there were probably some fossils, but um, not as much as later rocks. So it was hard to work with the fossils in the Cambrian unit there. Uh, so he ended up relying a lot on lithostratigraphy as he defined the Cambrian. So he was looking at the rock types there in the local area that he was mapping, and he defined his Cambrian system based on those local rocks that he saw in his locality. So Murchison, working from the top down, uh, he was using lithostratigraphy too, but he was also using the fossil content because in those Silurian rocks, 
there is more fossils, so he had kind of luxury of being able to use both. Uh, at the end, when they started comparing their work, uh, they sort of found out that, oh crap, there's like a substantial overlap here. Uh, things that Murchison called the Silurian, Sedgwick called the Cambrian. And there was just this massive decades long feud. It was like a four decade long dispute and every geologist in England kind of picked the side. And basically it just went on and on and on and on. And it wasn't settled until they both died. Uh, so 40 years later, the debate was finally ended when they both died and people no longer had like this huge emotional investment in the debate. And basically to settle it, we created the order division. So remember back on that former time scale, the order division was missing. Uh, this is where it came from. It's named after a Celtic tribe. Um, so sort of interesting. Again, one of the like greatest feuds in geologic history. There is a couple books that have been written about it. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we try to think of science as like this, uh, very objective, uh, impersonal, precise process, but personalities, biases, objectivity, opinions, they get in the way. And like we said before, like progress happens one retirement at a time, one funeral at a time. Uh, and this is definitely the case in this. Their dominant personalities um, just wouldn't, wouldn't let anything progress through until they were out of the way. Uh, so looking at fossil assemblages, so uh, geologists started using this faunal succession to map rocks. And so Dorbidney mapped 10 stages in France and again this idea that progress kind of gets stalled out by like entrenched ideas uh he interpreted these 10 stages as 10 different floods followed by 10 different creations so again this idea that uh, the great deluge um all the rocks that existed were laid down in the great deluge the great flood and all the organisms were kind of entombed in that catastrophic event. Uh, it went to this new method where, you know, okay, well, we're seeing that the organisms are different in each layer, so it can't just be one event. Okay, well, now there were 10 floods. And then he started breaking it down even further, and then he started invoking like 27 floods. And then the geologists were not thrilled with that. And then even the theologists started getting worried about it. Like, that's just too many. Too many creations. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many is too many, but 27 is clearly too many. Um, and at the same time, uh, Opel started working with congregations of fossils. So instead of just looking at like one or two like diagnostic fossils, he started looking at assemblages. So he started looking at groups of fossils. So for example, on this diagram down here, uh, this like yellow scallop, the blue star, in this green bivalve here, uh, their ranges go across the whole thickness of this rock unit. And so they're present in all three of the assemblages and they just don't help you at all with age ranges. If you look at the individual trilobite here, it's age ranges, this area, uh, this looks like maybe a gastropod or something. This area is here, maybe a cephalopod. And then this is, probably a cephalopod here as well, it has this range. So together, any, sorry, any one individual fauna has a relatively wide range. But if you put like three of them together, they only overlap over this short area. So when you start using multiple fossils, you're able to kind of pinpoint things a little bit more. And so if you define this assemblage based only on the overlap between these two, it gives you a much shorter interval than if you defined it based on this interval or this interval. If you define it by this and this, it's much shorter, much more precise. Uh, same thing here, defined by overlap. So moving away from like using individual diagnostic fossils to using groups of fossils uh, kind of increased the fidelity a little bit and made it a little bit more useful. And that was really the start of biospectigraphy. Uh, the groundwork that he laid was really the start of modern biostratigraphic zonation. And what controls the biostratigraphic zonation is the 
faunal succession, which is a con con confluence of evolution, ecology, and biogeography. Do those topics sound familiar? I sure hope so, because we just talked about them. Uh, that's why we talked about them. Uh, and the reason this whole thing's important, uh, one of the major reasons why you're taking this class, uh, fossils are cool, so that's one reason. Uh, but not only are they cool, but they're powerful. Uh, fossils are the only practical way of dating most sedimentary rocks. And whether you're a hard rock geologist or a soft rock geologist, we're all geologists that want to get jobs eventually. 75% uh, of the rock at the surface of the earth is sedimentary. So regardless of what discipline you find yourself in, you're almost certainly going to be working in sedimentary rock at some point, unless you're a volcanologist. Um, so it's good to get familiar with this stuff. Um, the only real other way of dating them is, is radioactive dating, radioactive decay. But uh, sedimentary rocks don't record those. They don't, they don't have radioactive uh, isotopes in them. Uh, you can date like ash layers and things like that, or sills that in intrude on top of sediments or in between. You can date those and kind of do like a bracketing, uh, but you can't really date sedimentary rocks directly. The only real way to do it is with fossils. So uh, this is the guy that literally wrote our paleo book, uh, pretty cool dude with his Darwin shirt. Uh, he says, again, no matter how the job market changes, which fads come and go, there's always going to be a need for biostratigraphers as long as geologists care about the age of their strata. And for a lot of purposes, uh, maybe the age of the strata doesn't actually really matter all that much. Uh, but it's very important in a lot of cases to, to know what you're kind of looking at. Um, so without biostratigraphy, you're trying to correlate from one area to another. It becomes an exercise in quote unquote matching up barcodes. So biostratigraphy evolution's directional. There's no repeats. There's no cycles. Uh, there are like the extinction adaptive radiation, extinction adaptive radiation cycles, but the organisms that are taking part are different. So it's a it's um, it doesn't loop back on itself. There's a directionality to it, uh, not like an end goal. We talked about that a little bit. It's not like progressive, but there's directionality to it. It doesn't go back. So aside from radioactive decay, all the other things that we could use to correlate from one place to another or date something accurately relies on cyclical processes. And anytime you're trying to match up cycles, it's going to produce a non-unique answer, or at least it can, and in most senses does. So if we think about lithostratigraphy, again, that's driven by these cyclic rock sequences. So transgressions, regressions, transgressions, regressions. Well, we talked about sequence stratigraphy a lot in said strat. Uh, those same sequences are seen over and over and over and over again. So when you see those high stand sands, the high stand sands of one sequence look a lot like the high stand sands of another sequence. The deep sea fan of one sequence looks very similar to the deep sea fan of another. And so it's very easy to start misconnecting these things. Uh, magnetostratigraphy is very powerful, uh, but it's basically magnetic stripes, the polarity, whether the poles at the north or the poles at the south, and it kind of switches back and forth. Uh, it's a binary thing. It's stripes, cyclical, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, relatively useful, but sort of hard to match definitively. Chemostratigraphy is the same way. So we talked about those oxygen isotopes, those carbon isotopes. Uh, strontium is another big one. Uh, those isotopes vary over time following cycles in the environment. So like, for example, the glacial cycle. Again, you end up with this kind of like cycle that loops back on itself. And you try to correlate peaks with peaks, and they might not be the same peaks. And then seismic stratigraphy is very much this way. Uh, seismic stratigraphy is responding to lithology. 
And so on the seismic amplitude map, you get these peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs uh, on some of those sections, like the blacks and the whites, um, the, uh, the colors on the seismic section. And you start trying to like match this section up with this section. It's literally like trying to match up a barcode. So this is one different barcode and another different barcode. It's a binary on off and there's patterns here. And there's a lot of different ways that you could match these barcodes up and say that this is the best, most similar way. And I could match it up and be very happy with my match. And then I show it to you and you'd be like, no way. What if I slide it like this? And I'd be like, oh, OK, well, that works too. Hmm, I wonder which one's right. Well, we don't know. But if we have this kind of bios, this unidirectional biostratigraphic information, that doesn't show these non-unique cycles, it's a lot easier to definitively match up this to this, makes life a lot easier, uh, prevents a lot of mistakes. Um, so uh, uh, index fossils, I'm not sure why I have to animate all those points, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so we're talking about biostratigraphy, stratigraphy using fossils. But not all fossils are created equal. Not all fossils are useful for biostratigraphy. So index fossils are the ones that we want to use. Index fossils are the best for biostratigraphy. And something that makes something a good index fossil are having hard body parts so that you're easily preserved, being widely distributed so that we can correlate using that fossil over large distances, like it's kind of cool to be able to correlate within the same basin, but it's very cool to be able to correlate to different basins or even different continents. Uh, smallish body size helps because smallish body size just means there's more of them. They're more abundant. There's more numbers and therefore more likely to be seen, be more likely to be preserved, be more likely to be collected, be more likely to be noted. Uh, they also need to evolve rapidly because again we're trying to like narrow the time window on these things and if an organism is around for a very long time without changing at all it's not super helpful so like lingula we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a couple slides lingula the inarticulate bi uh, brachiopod uh, it's been around since the cambrian it's totally useless for biostratigraphy if I see lingula, I don't know if I'm in the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, or the Cenozoic. I can't even narrow it down to the right era. Um, also being independent of environment. Again, lingula, we'll talk about that again. Lingula has lived in the same environment for 500 million years. It doesn't make it into all strata, so it's very restricted in where it is. It doesn't have a wide distribution. Uh, it is, however, very recognizable, and that's the last key, is that you need to be able to tell what the fossils are. If they have all these other criteria, but you can't tell it apart from something that's very similar, or it's very difficult to use them, uh, it's not going to work out very well. Uh, so at various different times in geologic history, uh, different fossils are useful. So in the Cenozoic uh, planktonic foraminifera, so we talked about forams. Uh, and other calcareous nanoplankton, so really tiny floating microorganisms, those are largely what we use in the Cenozoic. So in oil and gas exploration, a lot of the targets are Cenozoic, fairly recent in age. Uh, forams are the basic, for, basic foundation of those correlations. If you go back a little bit further to the Mesozoic, uh, those planktonic microfossils are still important, uh, but ammonoids, uh, those coiled cephalopods become a little bit more important. And then if you go back to the Paleozoic, in the late Paleozoic, ammonoids are important. Uh, and if you go back before that, especially in the Ordovician, uh, conodonts, graptolites, and then in the Cambrian, trilobites are important as well. Uh, so where you are in the geologic time scale, which rock unit you're looking at, uh, sort of dictates which fossils are going to be the ones that you're probably going to be using for biostratigraphy. Now we talked about index fossils being good for biostratigraphy. Facies fossils are terrible for biostratigraphy. So our good friend Lingula, which we talked about, 
Lingula are those inarticulate brachiopods. They've lived in muddy lagoonal environments for hundreds of millions of years, all the way since the Cambrian. They only live in that muddy lagoonal environment. They're restricted to a very narrow habitat. And so they're great for building EOD maps and mapping out paleoecology. If you see lingula fossils, you know, oh, okay, cool, I'm in a muddy lagoonal environment. But they're terrible for biostratigraphy because they're always in the muddy lagoonal environment through time. And so it doesn't tell you anything about the time. So facies fossils kind of track of facies as it moves through time. What we want for biostratigraphy is index fossils that have a very widespread zone. So they are independent of the environment. They show up in shallow, they show up in deep, they show up in all the environments. And they only exist for a relatively short time period because, again, we want to bracket these things as close as we can, as fine a resolution as we can. So things like uh, graptolites, they're planktonic, they float in the water column, they're everywhere in the world, whereas something that's more sessile, uh, benthic, on the seafloor, they generally are not good index fossils because their uh, distribution is relatively restricted and they're probably a little bit more like habitat sensitive. They try to stick in their environment. And so if you start mapping out, if you start trying to correlate with Lingula, you're essentially doing a lithostratigraph correlation. You're correlating the muddy lagoon with the muddy lagoon, and they may be completely different times. Uh, so if you're working in biostratigraphy, it's bio, biology, life, stratigraphy, so layers, in order for biostratigraphy to work, you need to put your bio, your life specimens, your fossil specimens, into the stratigraphic context. So if you're out doing biostratigraphic field work, you need to record precisely where you've gathered each individual sample in their stratigraphic position. So this is a pretty good example of this. Uh, here is our good friend, the stratigraphic column. A measured section and what you can see here is that it's in meters and they've done a very good job of defining lithologies so you start with describing the rock the they probably described you know grain size grain shape sorting bedding any sedimentary uh, structures that are present try to maybe get to an environment of deposition interpretation uh, but they've got a very precise description of the lithology and it's measured, and you see that they've also recorded in examples of where they collected individual species of, in this case, it's graptolites. This should be done while you're in the field. So as you're working in the field, you build your stratigraphic column. As you're collecting samples, you are placing them on that stratigraphic column. I collected this at X meters above my datum. I collected this at x plus three meters above my datum. And so it needs to be in the stratigraphic context. And in a lot of cases, you're actually gonna to have to take them home with you to the lab because identifying things, like it's very easy in the field to say like, okay, well, that's a trial bite, that's a graptolite, that's a brachiopod. Uh, so like, you know, phyla level, higher level uh, stuff is easy. Species level can be very difficult. Species level, the distinctions might be relatively small. You might actually have to collect the specimen, take it home, clean it off, do a little bit of prep work. Uh, you might even need to do thin sections in some case to see like internal structures, uh, especially with like bryozoans are notorious for that, where you actually have to open them up to, to, to distinguish to the species level. Uh, so it can be a, a non-trivial process to do that. And so you generally need the sample with you. So you go along, you describe the rock, you collect your samples, you mark where they came from. And at the end, you've got this big database of all these species with time. And then what do you do with it? Well, you start defining biozones. So once the data are collected, you plot up the range of the individual taxa, and then you start breaking them down into zones. So what do we mean by zones? 
Well, a range zone is all of the strata on Earth that contain that particular fossil species. So this is an example down here of time is the y-axis, place is the x-axis. So this is like distribution through space, and this is distribution through time. So this particular species originates here, and it goes extinct here. But at any given location, you're not seeing that entire range. So like if I'm at this outcrop, I start walking up the section, I see that organism, and then it disappears. And I'm like, oh, uh, I guess it's dead. It's extinct. And then I start walking up more, and whoa, it's back. What the hell? How did it come back from the dead? And then come back here, and then, OK, well, now it's extinct forever. And now it's gone. But elsewhere, it's not yet. So defining the full range zone can be very difficult. It, it involves looking in a lot of different places at a lot of different times to try to identify what the true time and space range is. Um, so that's the range zone. Uh, TL zone is basically looking at an individual location or an individual outcrop. So like here, this observed local range, that's the TL zone. It's different from the full range. And basically, we have to remember that if we're at any one outcrop, when an organism disappears, it doesn't necessarily mean that it died. Uh, it could mean that it went extinct. But uh, you know, there's this concept in cognitive development of object permanence. Uh, there's this silly little monkey here. And this baby really wants to get that silly little monkey. And then if you place a barrier in front of it, Oh my God, where'd it go? What the hell did you do to my monkey? Uh, same kind of thing here. Uh, we're walking up the outcrop, the fossil disappears. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's gone forever from all of the world. It might have just moved to a slightly different environment. And then when that environment comes back, the fossil comes back with it. So keep that in mind that uh, we're not seeing the full range at a local outcrop. And you can be kind of fooled uh, like a toddler. So don't, don't fall for that. Or I guess like a baby, uh, don't, don't fall for that. So um, there's a couple different types of zones. Uh, so the first type of zone is the interval zone. So interval is basically the strata that occur between two like documented lowest. So like first appearances and highest, like the last appearances of the taxa. So like, uh, if you define it based on one, it's from the time that it appears to the time it disappears. You can also define it based on two, where it's like from the time this one appears to the time that one disappears, or based both on first appearances, where it's the range between where this organism appears and then this organism appears. Or you can do it by uh, last appearance, where you define your zone based on when this organism disappears, and then this one disappears too. And so there's a couple different ways of defining these intervals using one or two taxa. That's an interval zone. An assemblage zone is taking it a little a step further and characterizing based on the association of three or more taxa. So in this case, they've got a lot of taxa, and this bio zone in between the green is defined by the presence of most of those taxa. And so we see that the ranges of a couple individuals is, is wider than that biozone. So using more fossils gives you more resolution. If you are making it more restrictive in saying that all these fossils have to be present, or rather most of these fossils have to be present, it starts kind of narrowing the range down a little bit. Uh, it also kind of minimizes the impact that the presence or absence of any one taxa causes. So like if, if one of these is a little bit more uh, environmentally restricted than others, it might leave when the environment changes and it might come back later when it returns. If you're only looking at that one fossil, that might be a problem. If you're looking at assemblage, maybe it's not quite as big of a deal. Uh, and then the third way is defining based on abundance. Uh, so this kind of like spindle diagram here, uh, 
uh, there's not a lot of occurrence, not a lot of occurrence, not a lot of occurrence, and then all of a sudden in this section of rock here, there's a lot of this particular organism at a different locality. There's the similar layer where there's a lot of that different organism. You correlate those as an abundance zone. Uh, same thing here, there's an earlier abundance zone down here. Uh, so that's the way that we define these biostratigraphic zones. Uh, but why do we care? So why do we care about these ages so much? Why does it matter what age a rock is? We can map around formations. So most stratigraphic formations, like say the Oswego sandstone, uh, the mappable scale units, they're time transgressive by environment. So formations are defined based on lithostratigraphy. Oswego sandstone is a sandstone. Uh, Trenton, Trenton and Black River limestones are limestones. Uh, formations and groups are generally defined on common lithologies. Uh, and that's, there can be some variability in there too. Um, but they're transgressive by environment, which means that as that environment moves through time and space, those formations move through time and space as well. Uh, Biostratigraphy uh, is one of the few ways that we can actually work out these age relationships. So if I am working in, this is from the Mohawk Valley in New York, uh, this is the Lake Strat column. So I go out in the field, I've got my strat column with me, and I'm walking up a given creek or outcrop. I might start at the Precambrian basement, walk up into the Beekman Town group, the Little Falls and the Tribes Hill. These rocks are gonna occur in a specific order. And then I'm gonna get into the Black River, the Trenton, and then the Utica Shale is on top of there, the three different members of the Utica Shale. So if I look only at this layer cake stratigraphy, I say that there's the basement, that's the oldest, that's gonna hold up pretty much everywhere. Uh, then on top is Little Falls, then the Tribes Hill, then the Black River, then the Trenton, and then the Utica's on top of that. That holds true for like a very local place. If I walk up a river, that's the order that I'm going to see it. But if you zoom out to a regional perspective, it starts getting a little bit more complicated than that. So this is a map basic map from west to east. This is kind of like uh, spatial. And then this is time. So there's the blue here, the dark blue. Those are the Trenton limestones, the carbonate platform, the Ordovician carbonate platform. And then over here, the orange, green, and the browns, those are the clastics of the Utica group, and then finally into the Schenectady. Uh, these are the clastics being shed off of that rising Taconic Highlands to the east. This is the Queenston clastic wedge starting to come in. And so early on, we have this carbonate ramp environment. And then it slowly over time starts getting buried by these clastics as the plate kind of subducts down and these clastics come in from the east. Uh, but if you look at the stratigraphic column here, Utica is overlying the Trenton. So the shales are older than the limestones. But if you look in detail on a regional basis, say like the Steuben limestone, the uppermost part of the Trenton, there are parts of the Utica shale to the east that are actually much older than the Steuben limestone. Eventually, this Indian castle member ends up on top of the Steuben limestone. So locally, Utica is on top of the Steuben limestone. But regionally, there's places where it's actually chronologically before. Uh, you're never going to see it below it, but it, it exists elsewhere older. So it's a 4D problem, right? Uh, locally, the Indian castle is not going to be below the Steuben. But if you move towards the east, again, these, these lithostratigraphic formations are time transgressive. They move through time by environment. And so you get this weird relationship where something that's on top of something on the stratigraphic column might actually be younger than something in a different locality. 
And how would we ever get to that if we've just got this layer cake lithostratigraphic view? Okay, well, Utica is on top of the limestone here, so the Utica is always older. In detail, that's not true. And how do we know that? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Um, but this is based on ash fall dating and graptolite biostratigraphy that we've mapped out these ages. Uh, this is called a Wheeler diagram, where the, 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 the formations are plotted in time and space, as opposed to just space. All these white areas are a time where no rock was deposited. These are unconformities here. So there's this big unconformity at the top of the carbonates uh, right before they get uh, capped off by these shales coming in, the clastic influx. Uh, so it's relatively complicated. Uh, one thing that you can see is that there can actually be like this intertonguing where you're building the carbonate ramp, building the carbonate ramp, building the carbonate ramp, and you get a pulse of clastics in, and then it goes away. The carbonates start building again, another pulse of clastics. Carbonates start building again, another pulse of clastics. Carbonates build a little bit, a bigger pulse of clastics. This is kind of like you're seeing episodically that the origin is building, the clastic wedge is building outwards from the east, and there is more and more influence of the clastics until it eventually buries the carbonate ramp entirely. And so this is a cool geologic story, and the only way that you can work it out is by looking at the different age relationships. So if you're trying to understand a geologic problem, knowing the ages of all the players and how they work with each other is very important. And if you look at just lithostratigraphy, you can't figure that out. So bear in mind that the sort of like layer cake stratigraphic column view is great for local work. But if you're doing something more regional, you might have to zoom out and really think about how these relationships happen in four dimensions. Uh, so pretty interesting. So biostratigraphy is very powerful. It's one of the main reasons why you'd want to take this class. Walking out of here, you're probably not going to be like identifying things to a species level. Uh, you're probably not going to be tasked with identifying a whole bunch of fossils. But you might be tasked with identifying rocks and correlating rocks based on biozones that somebody hands you. So usually a paleontologist will do the picks, the biostratigraphic picks, and they'll hand you well logs with the picks on there, and you'll do your lithostratigraphic picks, and along with the biostratigraphic picks, and you'll kind of put it together into an integrated story, a coherent time-based story, as opposed to just your rock-based story. Uh, so that's the power of biostratigraphy. And it's one of the main things that I hope you take out of this class. And that's all we got for today. So there is the usual disclaimer. And I hope everyone is staying safe. I hope everyone is still following along. Uh, it's very easy to kind of fall behind a little bit. So make sure you're keeping up with things. Make sure you're posting up interesting discussions and discussion board. And remember that we have Friday off. But we do not have Thursday off, so I'll uh, be posting up the lab for tomorrow. Make sure that you get last week's lab in in the digital Dropbox. And uh, I will see you on Monday.